Hey guys, today we're checking out a motherboard from ASRock. It is the 775i65G Revision 3.0. You might have seen this motherboard on the most recent pickups video. These are brand new, you can buy them from Newegg, you're looking at $50. This motherboard is extremely retro friendly, we've got an HUP slot but a 775 socket. You can use Windows 98, Millennium 2000 or Windows XP. We're going to look at a lot of things in this video, but if you're just interested in the short version, Shut up and take my money. That's the short version, just buy it. But for those who want to know more, we're gonna look at a lot of stuff. We're gonna have a quick look inside the box. We're gonna have a look at the layout of the motherboard. We'll check out the website, what resources are available, what processes is this motherboard compatible with. We will have a quick look into the BIOS and see if there's anything special going on. Then we are gonna run our normal Windows 98 benchmark uh, tests and we're gonna compare this system with a Celeron 420 running at 1.6 gigahertz and how it performs against the Pentium 4 running at 2.8 gigahertz as well as um, an Athlon 1000. And then I will swap the video card to G4 6800 GT. I just wanna see how it works under Windows 98. It's my first time using such a high powered AGP video card under Windows 98. We also have the power draw results to see how energy efficient this motherboard is later. We will switch the uh, processor to a faster Pentium dual core running at 3.2 gigahertz. So there's some CPU sc scaling going on. And then we're gonna switch to Windows XP and we will test the 6800 GT and how it compares against the Radeon 3850. Is the uh, bottleneck uh, going on? Is the bottleneck removed uh, compared to the uh, Athlon FX system that we used in one of the most recent videos? So there's lots of stuff to talk about. And of course, at the end of the video, uh, a nice summary and conclusion and my thoughts about this motherboard. Let's have a quick look what's in the box. We're getting an IO shield. There's one SATA cable. There's one ID ribbon cable. We're getting a driver disk and there's some software on there as well, as well as the quick installation guide slash manual. But uh, all the drivers in the manual, you can also download that from the website. Okay, let's have a look at the layout. So we have two DDR memory slots. There are two ID ports. The floppy interface is here, but we also get two SATA ports, which is awesome. So you can use SATA hard drives and SATA optical drives. We have an AGP ATX interface, three PCI slots. This is the chipset 865, but it's the version with integrated graphics. So we actually have a VGA port here, zero parallel to PS2, six USBs. There's a fast ethernet port as well as audio. The chipset for the ethernet controller is from Realtek and for sound, we've got a chip from C Media. Also nice is that the BIOS chip is removable. So if you've got an external programmer, it's a nice backup feature in case the BIOS flashing goes wrong. We get a USB header here. There's another one over there, but this one is actually shared with two of the ports on the back. The position of the ATX power connector is a little bit unfortunate, but there's not much we can do. Just a few words on the website. ASRock is really good. All the downloads and resources are still on the website. So looking at the BIOS, very interesting is that the version 1.0 is the final release. There's no other BIOS version for this motherboard. And that's because this is the revision 3.0. If you had an older motherboard, then there are lots of BIOS updates. For drivers under Windows 98, all you need are the chipset drivers and the USB 2.0 drivers. If you're using the onboard video card, then you also have to install the graphics drivers. This motherboard supports a ton of processors, including the Core 2 Quad and other CPUs with 1066 megahertz FSB. However, the front side bus gets overclocked. So I'm staying with 800 megahertz FSB processors. And you will see later in the video that the performance is just fine. We're gonna use a Pentium dual core E5800 running at 3.2 gigahertz. And I had a quick look at the bars. So you can change the front side bus, not only overclocking, but underclocking. For example, I took the Celeron 420, which runs at 1.6 gigahertz, and I halved the front side bus to 100 megahertz, and you now have an 800 megahertz processor, and that could be of interest to many of you trying to build an ultra low power or low performance machine to be more compatible with these older speed sensitive games. You can also change the memory speed as well as manually configuring the timings. There are voltage 
boost options for the memory and the chipset. This can be important if you're using uh, one of those fancy enthusiasts DDR400 module. They need higher voltage and then you need to manually dial in the timings. There's some basic fan control going on. The motherboard does support USB booting, so I was able to install Windows 98 and Windows XP from a USB flash drive. Press F11 to access the boot menu. Worth noting are the storage options in the BIOS. You have a choice between enhanced and compatibility. Basically for Windows 98, you wanna go with the compatibility option, but Windows XP, I installed it with enhanced option and a SATA hard drive installing Windows XP from a USB flash drive. In the manual, it mentions a hyper-threading option if you've got such a processor, which is good for Windows 98, so you can disable hyper-threading. However, there was no option to disable a second core, for example, in a dual-core processor, but it wasn't an issue. Windows 98 worked just fine. So let's have a look at the system for the Windows 98 benchmarks. As always, we're using the GeForce 2 GDS with 64 megabytes, and I'm using settings to make sure there are no bottlenecks so we can compare the performance. And the system will go ahead against uh, an Athlon 1000C as well as a Pentium 4 2.8. We have dual channel uh, config memory, two sticks of 256 megabyte, uh, CL3, nothing fancy. We're using a uh, Arctic Alpine 11 CPU cooler. For storage, we got an 80 gigabyte SATA SSD hard drive from Western Digital. We have the same deep cool power supply, 500 watts, so that the power measurements are also comparable across all the systems. We're not using an optical drive today. I'm using a USB thumb drive to install Windows. I've done two tutorials on how to install Windows 98 as well as Windows XP from USB flash drive. For the CPU, we're starting off with the Celeron 420 running at 1.6 gigahertz, but we will then later swap it out for a much faster Pentium dual core running at 3.2 gigahertz. So let's dive straight into the benchmarks. In Expendable, the processor seems to be too fast. We're not getting a result. It crashes to the desktop. In Draken, we're getting a higher score compared to the Pentium 4 running at 2.8. We can see the same thing in Quake 2. Here we have the results for the software render. Next up, the results for OpenGL on the video card, 667 FPS. Also in front of the Pentium 4 in Quake 3, 400 FPS. In the next game, we've got MDK2. Also, we can see more performance than the Pentium 4 running at 2.8. We can see, once again, the same thing in Series Sam and in Unreal Tournament. So we can see that the Celeron 420 has a much higher IPC and it outperforms the Pentium 4 running at 2.8 gigahertz. We will have a look at power consumption uh, very shortly, but now we're gonna swap out the processor out with the Celeron 420 and in with a Pentium dual core E5800 running at 3.2 gigahertz. Now in the BIOS, uh, this BIOS does not support switching off the second core. Uh, so a lot of BIOSes have this option, but it's not an issue. Windows 98 will just ignore the second core and see the processor as a single uh, single core processor. So let's have a look at the results. Once again, in Expandable, it crashes to the desktop, but in Draken, we can see now a much improved score. Moving on to Quake 2 in Software Render. Look at that, that's almost double the performance compared to the Celeron 420. We can see uh, a slight improvement in Quake 2 OpenGL. Here the video card might be uh, beginning to uh, be become a bottleneck. In Quake 3, once again, we can see nice scaling with the faster processor. Same goes for MDK2. And we can see in Series Sam a massive jump. So that's double the performance basically compared to the Celeron and leaving all the other processors far behind. And in Unreal Tournament, also a massive boost in performance, 418 FPS. So we can definitely see nice CPU scaling going to the E5800. And initially I was a bit worried uh, because I have tested the GeForce 2 and my benchmarking uh, methodology with faster processors, but nothing quite as fast. And I was worried that the video card is gonna hold things back, but we still saw some decent scaling going on, so that's awesome. So what we're gonna do now is have a look at uh, power consumption. With uh, all the processors, I always use the same power supply for the most recent tests. So this is a 500 watt fully modular 
power supply from Deepcool. And let's have a look. Uh, sitting idle on the desktop, we can clearly see that the Celeron 420 and the Pentium E5800 uh, pull less power than the Pentium 4 and a lot less than the Athlon. Very interesting is that the dual core Pentium actually draws less power than the Celeron. Maybe it's um, better binned, runs on a low voltage, or yeah, maybe it's just maybe it has some power saving features uh, integrated. Moving on to load, so this is uh, running in Quake 2 in software render. We can now see the uh, power uh, efficiency of these new processors really kick in. We're getting around uh, 69, 70 watts compared to around 100 watts of the other processors. And the next result is also in Quake 2 but in OpenGL at 1600 by 1200, so we're putting load on the video card, and once again around 70 watts for these new Socket 775 processors, whereas the other processors 104 and 108 watt. So that's pretty good. These processors have fantastic performance per watt. So we're getting performance well beyond a Pentium 4 running at 2.8 or 3 gigahertz, but consuming less power. So anyone interested in an efficient, quiet uh, system, this motherboard is definitely worth checking out. So for the next part, we're gonna stick with Windows 9.8, but we're gonna upgrade the video card and going with this one here, the NVIDIA GeForce 6800 GT. This is a very powerful video card, pretty much the latest officially supported NVIDIA GeForce um, that is uh, supported by Windows 98. And I've never used this. I've always been quite skeptical. Usually my go-to high-end video cards are the GeForce or Quadro FX range for Windows 98. But um, I've been reading on forums that some people have experience using the 6800 GT under Windows 98. So I thought, why not use this opportunity um, and try it out for myself. So I tried a couple of driver versions and if you're interested in giving those a go, I have a driver archive on our website. Not every driver, but uh, quite a few. So definitely a good starting point. So the first driver I tried was 6176 and that didn't work out at well. Uh, I got some blue screens and eventually I had to uh, boot into safe mode and then remove those drivers. The next driver version was 6694 and here some of the games did work but it got extremely slow FPS as well as uh, corrupted graphics and I will put some overlay on the video so you can uh, see what that looked like. And then I moved on to the next driver, version 7184, and here things started to uh, become a little bit uh, playable. So here we have got some Need for Speed gameplay, but even with this driver version, uh, later on when I left the game and just mucking around on the desktop, I would see some graphical uh, glitches. So at that, at that point, um, I had enough, I wanted to move on to Windows XP. Now this is not my final verdict, this is my first time using the 6800 GT and if you do know of a certain driver that works particularly well, do let me know and I will definitely revisit this topic. So don't feel like this is the end of <laughs> uh, going with the 6800 GT under Windows 9.8, it's not. It's uh, my first experience but I'm running out of time so I have to move on to the next part. Okay, what we're going to do next is switch the operating system to Windows XP. And for that, the first thing that has to go is the memory. 512 megabyte is just not cutting it. So we're going with 2 gigabytes. The motherboard only has two slots, so I'm using two 1 gigabyte uh, sticks of RAM. These are not very fancy. These are very generic uh, DDR. 400 SD RAM, so the BIOS is configured to get the timings from the SPD and the speed is set to 400 megahertz. And included in the benchmark results is also the Radeon 3850. We reviewed this video card recently on our channel and a lot of you have asked me to put together a faster HEP system to really stretch the legs of this video card. So let's find out how the 6800 GT compares against the 3850 on now a much faster HEP system. And I almost forgot, we're also changing the hard drive. Instead of an 80 gig, we're going with a Western Digital Blue with 250 gigabytes. This one is just a little bit faster. Let's have a look at some 3D Mark results first. The green bar is the 6800 GT and the red bar is the 3850. 
we can already here see the fast processor uh, doing its magic and separating the cards, but it gets a lot more impressive with 3D Mark 03. Look at that, almost triple the performance for the 3850. Now we're moving on to games. You can see the settings and details at the top of each chart. So here we can see the GeForce being outperformed by around 30% by the 3850. Moving on to Half-Life 2 Lost Coast, uh, look at that. Uh, that's an extra 100 FPS. Um, that game is quite demanding, so this is not Half-Life 2 uh, based uh, version from back in the day. It's been improved with some features added, so it's a lot more demanding. And here the 3850 can really show its potential. Moving on to Doom 3. And that's a game where the 6800 GT really shines. It's an NVIDIA card. They run Doom 3 really well. But even here, the 3850 is a lot faster. Moving on to X2, the threat. Once again, we can see the 3850 being way in front. And look at that. Fear at 1280 by 1024. Only 19 FPS on the G4 6800 GT. So that's a game that is just too demanding for this type of video card. Whereas the 3850 pumps out 82 FPS. So guys, let's wrap up this video. What an awesome motherboard. What's there not to like? There's something for everyone, be it a Windows 98, Millennium 2000 or Windows XP project. You can go for a efficient build, slowing down the processor, downclocking it for those old games and using a GeForce 2 for example. But you can go to the other extreme using a 6800 GD or something really fast like a Radeon 3850 and maxing out what AGP has to offer. Also a huge range of processors from something older like a Pentium 4 to something more modern. And for those who are into tweaking and overclocking, you can have a go at using a fast Core 2 or a Core 2 Quad. Also nice is that the capacitors are brand new. We're getting SATA ports so you can use modern hard drives. It has USB 2.0, so plugging in an external uh, USB hard drive, it's, it doesn't take too long when you're copying files under Windows 98. It's got Ethernet uh, integrated as well, which is handy. And yes, all in all, this is a fantastic motherboard. And really the motherboard, having a decent motherboard is the foundation for a retro PC and what uh, this motherboard is, if I have to uh, sum it up in one word, it's really flexibility. Uh, it doesn't matter what project you're working on, uh, this motherboard can kind of do it all, all the way from Windows 98 to something really fast with Windows XP. So yes, I can't recommend this motherboard highly enough. Um, I'm happy I bought, uh, I bought three now, so just for disclosure. And yep, I might even buy a few more because I can see these motherboards eventually being sold out. And um, I've had this issue many times in the past, be it something like an Audition 32 Plus sound card or those cheap Voodoo 3 video cards that were on eBay uh, for a while or those NEC wavetable boards. They're all gone and back in the day, people were hesitant to buy them. And um, yeah, don't hesitate. If you, uh, if you like what this motherboard has to offer, and you can afford the $50, just go for it. It's gonna last you many, many years, and um, I'm pretty sure that this motherboard will become quite sought after in a few years to come. And that's it for this video, guys. Do let me know what you think of this motherboard. Maybe you have one already. Maybe you're thinking of getting one. Any questions, uh, please leave them down below in the comments. I've done a lot of testing, but I try to keep it short and brief because otherwise no one is going to uh, watch the entire video. So if you're looking for any uh, specific details that I might have skipped, also ask below in the comments. I'll do my best to answer all the questions. And that's it, guys. Thank you so much for watching. If you found this video interesting and you want to see more stuff like it, please subscribe to the channel, uh, click on that notification bell so you're getting all the updates, give it a like and thank you for watching, I shall see you soon with another one.